we will start this is just a disclosure in the uh, start of the presentation i have included a number of photographs uh, and figures both from the book and of course on the internet and because covid the permission was not duly taken so it has to be actually disclosed in this that's just the start of this okay so we will be talking about the abdominal hernia today we will all hernia today just uh, the figure must have seen a couple of or a number of times i think but coming on to the groin hernia the last time i think we we said we start about the groin hernia and this is a picture of a lower part of the abdominal wall the inguinal region you can see the fourth receptacle this is the inguinal area this is the receptacle area the area which is weak and is further weakened by the the standing posture that we adopt right so this uh, by convention is basically a weak area if you look at these four areas with the maximum uh, pressure exerted on any kind of increase in the abdominal pressure starting from medial to lateral you find this is a supravesical area then you find the inguinal area and you find the medial inguinal area the lateral inguinal area and then underneath the inguinal ligament this is inguinal ligament you find the femoral area so these are the four potential areas where you find the weakness in the lower part of the abdominal wall right uh, collectively would be terming as a groin hernia now this area is called he known as what is known as the cruchot spiriform myopectinal orifice why myopectinal it has got both muscle muscle and of course bone as the uh, margins of the boundaries right so above we got the arching fibers see the arching fibers of internal oblique and transverse abdominal then you got the ligament out here uh, laterally you find the iliopsoas muscle then you find basically the part of the pubic bone and inside you find the iliopectinal line and medially you will find the lateral part of the rectus muscle along with transverse abdominis and the tendinous part of the transverse abdominis muscle right so this is basically evolutionary i was just telling you the evolutionary weak area and the bipedal stance further increases the weakening in this particular area now this uh, fruch out orifice this type of the first time not very uh, early the only 1956 was type of the first time uh, pyriform myopectinal orifice got two components number one is the supraguinal stands to reason above the inguinal uh, inguinal ligament and below the inguinal ligament so above the inguinal ligament you got the the supra inguinal also known as the heptert triangle and below it you find basically from lateral to medial you find the the muscle compartment you find the vascular compartment and then you find the femoral compartment right so these are basically three parts of the inside valve region they are seen from outside and seen from inside it's just a uh, uh, turning the page inside out and you find the same things out here so if you look at from uh, look at it from inside you'll find the iliopsoas muscle out here and this is from the pelvis the vessels entering and leaving uh, into the thigh and then you find the lacrimal ligament the cupus ligament and you find the area of the femoral uh, canal the femoral opening and the femoral canal so this is basically looking at the two sort orifice from inside and outside okay now this is basically a pre peritoneal view of the same area and if you are careful look carefully you will find this is basically the pubis this is the inguinal inguinal ligament right so from inside you don't see the inguinal ligament what you see is basically the ilio pubic tract and then what do you find you find the arching fibers out here these are arching fibers which are fibers which are not the transverse abdominis and internal oblique but what you are seeing from inside and what you see from the inside is basically the arching fibers the transverse abdominis fascia we'll talk about what those arching fibers are all about right now here you find the deep ring and you find the vas deferens and you find the vessels entering into the deep ring and here you find the epi gastric vessels right and this is basically the external iliac vessels and here you find basically an area which is a weakened area and this is the area where you find the femoral area so lacrimal ligament and just inside you find the femoral opening and in front of this find the femoral canal so if you look at the pre peritoneal spaces we talk about, so now we we talked about the the abdomen for a moment let's go behind and let's proceed from the peritoneum outward so in front of the peritoneum you find what is known as the pre peritoneal space now what these pre peritoneal space is all about Now, if you look at from uh, look at it from inside, you find the three raphes, right? You find the median raphe, nothing but the obliterated uracus. Then you find the medial, that is the L. This is the N. This is the L. Both of them M. So M N and M L. We call it M L and M N because sake of pronunciation, because it's very difficult to uh, differentiate the pronunciation of medial and median. Okay, so this medial is basically nothing but the obliterated uh, umbilical arteries, except for the initial or the uh, proximal most part. which gives out or uh, sustains itself as a inferior vesical artery right so the rest of it is all obliterated except the proximal most part and then you come to this particular peritoneal fold which is a fold over the inferior epigastric or the lateral umbilical fold 
Now, why the need to define these four? Because we have to define triangles in between these four. So, areas in between these four. So, here you got the supravesical area. Combine both of them. So, you got the two supravesical areas, right? The, the one on the right and one on the left. Okay. Now, in between the medial and the lateral of lateral ligament, you basically have what is known as the, the uh, area which is lying in between these two and one of the medial triangles. And here you got the lateral triangle. Lateral triangle basically means lying lateral to the interior pigastrum, right? So the the deep involved ring lies the lateral triangle, and the direct involved ring or the or the posterior wall of the uh, inval canal from where the direct involved hernia is going to proceed outside is basically lying in the medial triangle. So you got the median triangle, the medial triangle, and the lateral triangle, right? This is being depicted as seen from outside. So you have the interior pigastric, you have the median, uh, the L ligament, and the N ligament, right? So supravesical medial and lateral. That's how you look at it, right? Now, now this is basically a laparoscopic view, what you see from inside, that was a figure. Now, this is an actual view, what you see, and if you are careful to look at, this is basically a pubic sympathy, right? The pubic bone, pubic sympathy, okay. So, this is a ligament, which is the, the end ligament, right? So you can very clearly see these two folds again. This is basically a fold of the obliterated oblical artery, so it's not the L ligament, medial, and here you got the inferior epigastric because it's seen very, very clearly. That's the lateral plateau ligament. And here, if you're very careful to see, this is basically the, the deep inguinal ring out there, right? So these are the, the three triangles the three triangles one, two, and three. Again, they're just depicted uh, to be shown very clearly. What else you see out here is the transverse to cycle fold. We talk about that, what this fold is all about in the, in the later part of the lecture. And this is basically when you dissect it out, this is more clearly seen. There's the three areas. So you got the pubic tubercle out here, and you find the operator area, you find the femoral area, and you find basically the, the triangle formed by what? By the vessels and the and the vasopressor. Okay. Now, now coming to the prepetal spaces, because when you talk about the prepetal area, we'll talk about prepetal space, uh, spaces. Why? Because these spaces are important because there are structures lying out here. And we were studying hernia. When we were studying hernia in the 80s, we never knew about these spaces. They existed. They existed at that point of time, but we never knew about them. Why? Because this part of the anatomy was never taught to us. Why? Because this part of the anatomy was not important at that point of time. We were never entering this particular area uh, in, in such a big way, in such a big way. But when we came on to the laparoscopic approaches, now we were entering primarily to this area. So we need to understand what this area is all about. So we have to understand that there are two spaces out here, and these two spaces are important. Why? Because all the dissection and laparoscopic approach to a hernia is being done in this particular area. So we have to understand what these spaces are all about. And chief among them is basically known as the space of rigidus. This is basically lying somewhere out here. This is the space of rigidus. You see the pubic sympathies, the pubic bones, and here would be the bladder. So this is basically the space of rigidus. Now, if you look at the space of rigidus, you will find that there is a layer of fascia out here and the bladder out here. So if you look at the boundaries of the space of rigidus, you will find from craniocaudal, right? The craniocaudal, you will find the muscular for the pelvis to umbilicus. Sorry, it should be cord uh, cordocranial. Uh, from uh, below upward. So you have the muscular flow of the pelvis lying out here. This is the muscular flow of the pelvis out here, through which the bladder, uh, the neck of the bladder, uh, just in the region neck of the bladder, which on the strict territory, that's the, the, the muscular flow of the pelvis. And you proceed upwards, you find the bone, the bone, uh, bony part, and then basically uh, upwards, you find the inguinal fossa, right? So muscular flow of the pelvis to umbilicus. Now, what, what we understood at that point in time was that the space of radius was located just behind the pubic. It didn't extend up. But no, we now understand right from the pubis upward, it goes right to the, uh, to the umbilical. So from caudal to cranial, it has to go from the muscular floor of the pelvis up to the umbilical. That is the whole extent of the space of rigid. And here, if you look at the boundaries from below upwards, you'll find the posterior surface of the pubic bone out here. And then a thin connective tissue up to the linea temporalis, that means lateral. Huh? And posterior rectus sheath above. So, somewhere here at the arcuate line, you will encounter the posterior rectus sheath. So, that is basically would be forming the uh, anterior boundary. So, posterior rectus sheath, a thin layer of fascia, and the pubic bone. This whole thing forms the anterior boundary. What are the posterior boundary? Posterior boundary, if you look, this is the, the bladder. And coating this bladder is a fascia which is known as the vesico umbilical fascia, which is from the inner layer of the uh, transverse fascia or the third layer of transverse fascia. Okay, now basically what we understand is the transverse fascia got three layers to it. Two of them would stick to the abdominal wall and one of them would be there along the peritoneum. As easy as that. Why? 
because the third layer is what known as the preperitoneal fascia and that is basically always sticking to the peritoneum so two layers stick to the anterior wall one layer sticks to the peritoneum so the layer number 3 which forms the vesicomalacal fascia in this area is known as vesicomalacal fascia extending right up to from the floor right up to the umbilicus so somewhere here so it's extending from here to here right so this is basically the posterior uh, uh, boundary and attached to this fascia you will have the bladder and the peritoneum okay now laterally if you look laterally yeah. the lateral wall of the bony pelvis agreed here is the lateral wall of the pelvis. this whole thing is the bony pelvis we all know that but more clearly as you come out of the bony pelvis what would then form because now we have said that the space of radius is right up to this particular area and bony pelvis see is extending only to this particular area this is the bony pelvis so what forms the lateral boundary out here in between the top of the pubic bone and the umbilicus now as you go more clearly it is either the medial that is the l ligament or the lateral umbilical ligament which forms the boundary now that is still debatable that's still debatable because see in this figure here see the inferior epigastric now this would be forming what the lateral umbilical fold so is the space extending from here to here or somewhere here would be what the obliterate umbilical artery is the space extending from here to here that is what is questionable why because now what this is that from here that is the medial l umbilical fold beyond is what is known as the space of bogram now that is one method of describing the space of radius and the space of bogram so at this point of time just remember either the lateral boundary would be the l ligament or the lateral umbilical ligament that is the ml ligament or the lateral umbilical ligament we'll just uh, come to that okay now come to the next so what are the contents now we understand what this space is all about we know that is lying the walls of the uh, bony pelvis are forming the the space of radius the particular area where we are going through all the dissection and higher up would be basically the inferior uh, epigastric vessels now these are the main vessels we will be encountering in all kind of dissection now if you look at the wall this is the bony wall of the pelvis if you look out here see the iliac artery external and external iliac vein very clearly seen if you look in this figure this is the bony wall you find the artery and the vein okay now lower down you'll find what the internal iliac and coming from here you will find the obturator so these are the obturators see the obturators these are the obturators out here the obturator nerve underneath will be the obturator artery and the obturator vein this is the vein right entering where into the obturator foramen okay and below you find the obturator uh, internus and you find the obturator membrane okay so they are entering out here so this whole thing is the bony uh, pelvis and lateral wall of the uh, space of radius now do we do a dissection out here no we don't normally we don't dissect so deep down we don't do the dissection deep down but we have to understand this particular area why because there could be aberrant vessels out here there could be a number of aberrant vessels out here and these aberrant vessels exist in almost 25 to 40% of it 25 to 40% look that is a very uh, sizable number and the vein aberrant vein are more common than the uh, the aberrant artery Now, normally, this obturator usually arises from what the anterior division of the internal uh, internal iliac artery. But see, here it's arising from where the external iliac. And there's a communication from what this is the inferior epigastric. Okay, there's a communication out here. So basically, what we're looking at is an ap uh, apparent obturator artery and vein. A vein arises from the external iliac and an artery arising from the inferior epigastric, or it could arise directly from the external iliac vessel. So this basically confluence out here is one of the most dangerous configuration one of the most dangerous configuration how do you how do you recognize that the recognition is very simple now see this is the pubic bone okay the lateral of the pelvis and the pubic bone i'll again stress this in one of the future slides but remember one thing that this particular area this part of the bony pelvis or the posterior part of the pubic bone or the uh, pubic bone there is no reason for any vessel to be running across absolutely not every vessel should be following the long axis any vessel running out here like this is an abnormal vessel period you can underline that there is no vessel which normally runs across if there is a vessel running across it is an aberrant okay so you have all kinds of aberrant vessels you have aberrant artery a vein then you can have atypical vessels running along supplying the bladder or you can even have an aberrant vessel supplying the or accessory pudendal vessel form in almost 10% of patients but we normally don't go deep down that area but this area is very important so we have to understand 
the the aberrant obstructive artery and the vein and the atypical vessels to the due to bladder right now we are talking about the space of bogros right now we said that the space of bogros would be either extending from yeah either extending from lateral to the inferior epigastric that is the lateral umbilical fold or the obliterated umbilical artery which is the medial umbilical fold so either from here laterally or from here laterally anyway we have to look at what the bogros space is all about now bogros was basically a french scientist or so probably a italian scientist and basically he wanted to approach how the the space got its name he wanted to approach the external iliac vessels without doing a formal laparotomy right so what is it this is not a, a space which is recognized only recently it was 18 something when it was recognized for the first time last century okay so he wanted to approach this particular area so what did he do he basically made a incision out here in this part is just superior to the inguinal ligament and he did what he basically made an incision and he could directly approach these two vessels he could easily isolate both the external iliac artery and the external iliac vein very easily done so he named this space because his approach was such that it was a direct entry to the external vessels so he named this space space of bogros now later on this space of bogros was basically Deemed to include a number of other structures. Yeah. So this is basically a triangular space, a very triangular space. And basically, initially, the initial assessment when he described for the first time, it is a very very small space, a very small space. See this, 1.3 to 1.5 centimeter in 2.5 centimeter at the most. But now we understand it's probably a larger space. Why? Because we now designate the whole thing lying beyond the intraepigastric as the bogros. the whole thing right so that is basically the topographical area but in relation to peritoneum and in relation to the to the uh, anterior wall where does it lie basically it is lying see these are three layers right aponeurosis layer number 1 layer number 2 and the preperitoneal fascia now this is basically layer 2 and layer 3 initial space of bogros was between layer 1 and layer 3 now we know it lies between layer 2 and layer 3 as any other preperitoneal space space of red zeal 2 and 3 space of bogros 2 and 3 so remember this basically we talk about all preperitoneal spaces it is a space which is on the one hand between the transalis fascia layer sticking to the anterior wall which means 1 and 2 and the preperitoneal fascia sticking to the peritoneum which means layer 3 and as simple as that don't forget this if you understand this everything will be absolutely clear and why that should have has to be clear for the simple reason that there are no known vessels in this particular area you do a dissection in this particular area you are not going to damage anything in the anterior wall why because all anterior wall vessels are lying between layer 1 and layer 2 remember this you dissect you do a preperitoneal uh, preperitoneal dissection and what do you find you find that there is bleeding means you went to the wrong place You are dissecting between one and two. Don't do it. It should be absolutely a vascular dissection. So if you are doing a TAPP, you are doing a TEP, you are doing any kind of dissection in a particular area, it should be absolutely a vas. Right now, so we know that now laterally where it is extending. What about posteriorly? Posteriorly, look at this figure. This is the anterior wall. This is the posterior wall, and this is the kidney out here. Right now, what is happening out here is somewhere here we know is the space of bogra. Now see, posteriorly, it is extending with what the soas muscle and this particular fascia, which is the anterior and the posterior extension, the combined extension of the fascia of the supercanal. Which means that the bogros space extends posteriorly, it extends medially, combining the rizier space, extends laterally along the abdominal wall. Right. So we look at the boundaries: anteriorly superficial uh, transverse fascia, superficial; medially intraepigastric blood vessels. laterally pelvic wall so now for this sake of definition we would stick to lying lateral to the lul or the lateral umbilical ligament okay posteriorly comma uh, is uh, it, it joins the uh, fascia of the soas muscle external iliac vessel femoral nerve and more posteriorly continues to the paraurethral but what about the contents of this particular area apart from the two vessels we just not talked about the approach they did not exactly lie in the bogros space so what lies in the bogros space In bogra space, one thing which lies is the pendivid between layer one and layer two transalis fascia. What is this arcade all about? You have been looking at this picture time and again. Now see this vessel. That is the external iliac vein. 
inferior epigastric vein here arises a branch ileophobic vein now this is the rectus muscle drained by three veins if you remember the anatomy in the first class i told you the lesser known veins draining the rectum uh, the rectus and these are the two cl veins branch number 1 number 2 now where do these veins drain into they basically drain in common and they form a communication over the rectusio epigastric communicating vein see it's an asymmetric out at the same time the the inferior epigastric also be on other vein for the ileopubic vein along the cooper's ligament now this way is an important because it is lying along the cooper's ligament and the lacunar ligament this would come later on when we are talking about the femoral hernia and lacunar ligament injury right so remember this this way remember this way is coming along the superior uh, superior surface of the pubic bone along the cooper's ligament would be in close association with lacunar ligament somewhere out here and it's again an asymmetric with what another retrocubic vein right so you have a full vena cava out here inferior epigastric the two cl ileopubic vein and the retrocubic vein this whole thing forms an arcade venous arcade which often leads to troublesome bleeding when you're doing a dissection of particular area remember when you're doing a dissection when you're trying to separate the inferior epigastric vein from the inferior epigastric you are very careful that the inferior epigastric is not damaged you are very happy but suddenly what do you find you find there is there is a troublesome venous bleed they can't understand where they're coming from that is coming from the arcade of kind of close to the yes please please close your mic please and the the testicular veins which are draining the papillary complex right now the second thing apart from the CT we need to know is and the venous arcade we know what the nerves are very easy to understand not very difficult this is somewhere out here the lumbar plexus the quadratus lumborum and from under the quadratus lumborum you find the exit of two important nerves the iliohepatogastric and the ilio inguinal right they are running between what under the surface of the quadratus lumborum they run for some time over the uh, transverse abdominis they puncture the transverse abdominis and then they lie in between transverse abdominis at the external oblique at the level this is the asis at the level of asis now they would puncture the internal oblique and then they come to lie in between the external oblique and the internal oblique. so very easy out lumbar plexus coming out from behind the quadratus lumborum on the surface transverse abdominis perforating transverse abdominis entering on the surface internal oblique perforating internal oblique at asis and then entering into the area which would be entering when we do any kind of hernia surgery in particular area so that's why we find these two nerves when we just uh, split the external oblique and raise the flap we find both these nerves so where they entered from they entered from just at the level of asis where they have come from behind the internal oblique to in front of the internal oblique right so that is where they enter the second way that we need to know uh, the artery uh, the nerve valve so these are the two uh, nerves we were talking about the second nerve is again from the lumbar plexus and that is the lateral ferus nerve of the heart running very near or exiting the under the inguinal ligament very near to the asi and is valid spine the femoral nerve is usually not encountered unless and until you are going to damage the swath muscle there is a swath muscle lateral swath so excessive dissection out here is prohibited What is prohibited? You don't dissect the swath. Don't do it. Don't dissect the swath fascia. The moment you do the dissect swath fascia, you're going to injure all these nerves. This is iliac muscle, and this basically is swath muscle. So leave this fascia over this. Why? Under this fascia, you got all these nerves. So don't damage the fascia. You will not damage the nerves. You damage the fascia, you're going to damage these nerves, leading to post-operative neuralgias of all kinds. And if you by chance see the fever nerve be sure of one thing that your dissection has been absolutely bad why because it's gone too deep enough the fever nerve should never be visible in your dissection whether you're doing a tapp or you're doing a t right never now what about this nerve uh, we are talking about this this is genital fever nerve again a branch of lumbar nerve uh, of the lumbar plexus but it divides into two see the clear division one of them the genital branch would be entering the inguinal ligament out Uh, the inguinal canal out here the rest the second one the femoral branch would be going it needs the inguinal ligament and see it enters the femoral sheath can you see this it's entering the femoral sheath 
so the femoral branch of the genitor femoral nerve exits the uh, the abdomen into the thigh along inside the femoral sheath the genital branch enters into the inguinal canal so that is very easy to remember now what is very very particular about this is that remember when you're doing a tep or tcp and want to use staplers right now what has been advised is that do not give any or do not uh, staple the mesh below the inguinal ligament agreed we all know that why see this is one ligament now if we apply a staple out here we are going to staple these nerves you will damage these nerves so i would like to staple above but there is one more thing see this tendon 20% of the nerves give out the aberrant branch above the iliopubic branch right now that means about 2 to 3 cm beyond so basically what we are looking at is that no staple should be uh no staple should be applied not only above the inguinal ligament but not up to 3 cm to 3 cm of the inguinal ligament if you do that then you're safe you will not have any kind of problem in these cases so remember staples not only above the inguinal ligament but not 3 cm within a vicinity of 3 cm of inguinal ligament it should be 3 cm cranial to the inguinal ligament beyond that so this is how it looks like see the exit from this particular area you see the the lateral femoral nerve just near the asis right and here you find the other nerves right now now coming when we describe all this we describe all this we describe about the the preparatory we have described the space of ribius and we describe about the the uh, bogra space we know about the vessels out there in the lateral wall of the of the pelvis we know about the nerves out there so how is it important to us now the importance of this basically is this is a diagrammatic view i'll show you a view out here now look at this this is basically a view which is showing the the two things one the vessel and the vas deferens the pubic bone this is the vas deferens right sorry uh, we've gone off of this so this is basically the iliac branch this is the vas deferens you find the upper part this is the pubic tubercle right now now what is happening out here is that you find the vessels out here which vessels i told you no vessel should be running like this is any vessel running out here just a faint trace out here but none of the vessels so if there is no vessel running like this you are going to damage it but if you damage any vessel out here at a pressure of we are working at 12 mm of mercury or 10 mm of mercury the veins are easily collapsible so any injury to the vein in this particular time would not be easily recognized you won't recognize it right so no bleeding the moment the pressure is received as soon as you have done your surgery and you close thing now this vein starts oozing and it keeps on oozing and suddenly after 4 to 6 hours or 1 or 2 hours after in the post operative ward the patient has severe hypertension so i can understand what that happened that the reason the most common reason is that you have damaged the particular area that's why it's known as the corona mortis the crown the mortal crown it's known as mortal crown right in between these two structures can you see the structure this external iliac vessel that's why it's not triangular too don't go beyond this don't try to dissect these two vessels don't unless until you're doing what you're doing a lymph node dissection don't do it in a hernia surgery don't try to dissect them out in a in a surgery where you're doing a radical kind of some kind of a prostatectomy radical hysterectomy okay go ahead and do it because you have to uh, dissect the lymph nodes out of it and lateral to it i told you about these three nerves these are the nerves which will be damaged you lateral to it you're going to damage these right so this is basically the triangular tumor out here this is basically the corona mortis in some region uh, here and this is basically the triangular tumor. so these are the three areas very uh, aptly described why because damage to these three areas so these are three areas see three areas what's the friend so this is basically can you see between the two this is basically the triangular tumor this is the corona mortis out here this is pubic tubercle out here this is corona mortis and this is basically the triangular tumor right so now we have proceeded from where we know about the the preperitoneal facial layer now let's go more anterior right we from the peritoneum we went to the preperitoneal uh, spaces now let's go more anterior we are talking about a layer which is sticking to the posterior uh, posterior part of the abdominal wall and that is facial transversalis we said third layer sticks with the peritoneum layer 1 and layer 2 sticks with the with the abdominal wall and that is why the dicta is when you are doing a repair, uh, dissection a tep or tabt always try to stick to what the abdominal wall or the peritoneum to so the peritoneum 
okay so dissection should be toward the peritoneum along the peritoneum not along the anterior wall just remember that any dissection in tp tpp the dissection should be toward the peritoneum not towards the anterior wall okay now if you look at the facial transverse talus this basically see this figure is a very good figure this is basically the tendon can you see the internal oblique and transverse abdominis forming the conjoint not the tendon like you call a conjoint area I'll just tell you why the not conjoint area and you see this rolled up this is basically the transalis fascia that, that's how it looks a transalis fascia and see the vessel lying in between right this is basically the pectineal ligament okay and the transalis fascia attached out here now that is basically the transalis fascia sticking to the anterior wall and which part of that is that is basically layer number 1 and layer 2 but as a whole if you look at transalis fascia this whole thing is transalis fascia see whole thing is that's why it's not the endo abdominal why endo abdominal because it is uh, gripping all these structures inside all structures inside right so you have transalis fascia out here and then here and then becomes continuous with the zucker candle fascia see the two the two anterior posterior zucker candle combined and it combines and forms the the joins the transalis fascia so you have the fascia iliaca the the joining of the two fascia so that is basically a fascia which is Uh, enclosing every abdominal structure right opposition to the posterior part of the aponeuros and it forms the anterior boundary of the preparietal spaces we already said that where the preparietal space in between layer 2 and layer 3 we already said that right what we have to understand is that the transalis fascia is usually a single layer structure agreed but below the arcuate line somewhere out here it attains a right abdominal structure so below the arcuate line the single layer transalis fascia differentiates into three layers why because it accommodate major vessel flow so the transalis fascia is a single layer posteriorly and anteriorly above the arcuate line below that it is all a three layer structure right and then we have to know that there are a number of thickenings of analogs in transalis fascia and because remember the weak area of any part of the of the abdomen is where the part from where something is exiting like for example something exiting from the abdomen into the thorax the esophagus the aorta the inferior vena cava these are all weak areas right similarly below now this is the weak area the cord is coming out the vessels are coming out so these are basically inherently weak area so these weak areas because they have to come out somewhere from here they have to make orifices in the transalis fascia right okay now this basically layer transalis fascia seen very well so we look at this figure there are two muscles out here and then you find the two layers transalis fascia see and then you find the yellow structure what is this this is a preperitoneal fat the preperitoneal fascia and this is the peritoneum so this is layer number 3 of the uh, fascia transalis layer number 1 layer number 2 and layer number 3 right again the same thing seen out here okay so this is basically again the same thing represented out here here what else you can see is Uh, because when you come to the inguinal canal you can see this very clearly these are the two layers which are normally joined only in 5% of the cases but they go together forming the posterior wall so this is basically the cord structure they go posteriorly and they do what they attach to the lacrimal ligament and the iliopectineal line or the cupus ligament and anteriorly go the external oblique so this is how it looks like you cut a cross section out here a sagittal section in this particular area will give a figure something like this now see the difference between the two see the muscle extending below see the muscle extending only up to this point and become a conjoint tendon this figure would be tenable only in 5% cases the rest 95% of cases would be have something like this right so so here are basically the two layers of the transalis fascia and the third is the preparietal fascia so if you look at the attached fascia transalis it is going to be attached somewhere here iliac crest between what between the attached transversus and the iliac right and then it sticks to the inguinal ligament up to this part here it will be giving a hole a hole wall perforated for what perforated for two things for the deep uh, for the, the dir and for the vessel right and then again from here it goes and lies on the iliopectineal line and the lacrimal ligament okay and then getting attached here up to the linea alba so that is the basic attachment so medially is going to go right to the pubic bone and form the and go attach behind the uh, rectus abdominis right to the linea linea alba so 
above i just now told you both the layers would be confluent at the arcuate line so the arcuate line and below the arcuate line if you try to find this particular layer the layer will be very difficult that's why the pre vesical fascia is extending not of the blackus only up to the arcuate line okay so laterally follow the curve of the abdominal wall that's what you see it's extending from here falling up to here up to this particular plane now we already uh, talked about this figure uh, the anti and the posterior layer i'm not going to go into this particular uh, figure again we all talked about that so what is this preparal fascia or layer number 3 of the transalis fascia this is basically a condensation of fibrous tissue it is not a true fascia in the strict sense and that's why it's known as the posterior layer transalis fascia it forms a conical sheet around the existing structure exiting structure now existing exiting so whatever exists the abdomen that means the vessels the the the, the structures going from the dir to the into the vanal canal these are all would be forming a cone with the uh, posterior layer of the transalis fascia and it is also a umbilical pre vesicular fascia we just talked about we talked about the posterior boundary of the space of regius and i said earlier easily identified from top to bottom one more thing we need to be remember we know that below the arcuate line we have the three layers but laterally up to what plane do you find these three layers these three layers can easily be seen up to basically the lateral umbilical uh, the lateral uh, umbilical fold and, and not um, lateral to it so you just find particular uh, up to that point of space so this is something from the side i don't think you'll be able to understand it i'll just explain now this is basically what we talk about see the atrial wall and see the vessel sticking to the atrial wall and this is a peritoneum so where is the dissection going on in between and what is this layer the alveolar or the cotton wool appearance that is layer number 3 see this that is layer number 3 the moment we go between 2 and 1 we'll cut this we'll cut this so where are we layer number 3 okay so remember whenever you're doing a dissection peritoneum towards the peritoneum not towards the abdominal wall you know that and the reason i just now gave that means it's a very important part of transalis fascia and that is the analog of transalis fascia now, what the need for analog why do we need to know these are i just skip this early area i'll just come back to this the clinical importance of analogs is multifold number one it may redefine the hasselbeck triangle for you number one number two it can re-explain a shutter mechanism i hope you know from a knowledge of physiology in first and second year what the shutter mechanism in guanal area is the shutter mechanism when we were taught was basically that whenever there is a rising internal pressure what prevents uh, the Uh, uh, hernia from occurring in this particular area, the approximation of the transverse abdominis and the internal oblique to the guanal ligament. So they approximate, the curved side becomes straight. They approximate, and then nothing can exit. So it gives a buttress to this particular area. That's the channel again. The Cooper ligament repair is very important uh, part of the analog. Added strength to weak wall of the guanal canal, and because it's a thick structure, it will hold sutures better in this area. So what are these analogs all about? Look at this figure. You will be able to understand it much better. This is basically an anterior view. What have we done? We have removed the external oblique, we have removed the internal oblique, and we removed the transverse abdominis. What is lying behind? At our abdominis. We are just having the. This is basically the fascia, transverse fascia, not even transverse abdominis. Uh, no, no, no. That all thing has been removed. So this is in front of you is basically what the fascia is looking like. Now in this particular area, the inguinal area, you will find the arching fibers out here, known as Transverse abdominis, like that. You find this particular sling-like structure out here, and this is what this is a transverse facial sling. What is the slinging? It forming the medial boundary of the of the deep inguinal, right? Here you have a structure which is lying just behind the fibers of the abdominis, known as the Henle's ligament, right? And a structure which is lying parallel, running parallel to the inguinal ligament. But lying posteriorly is the iliac ligament. So we got the the uh, Thomson's ligament or the bandlet of Thomson, the iliac tract. We got the monk's hood or the transalis facial sling. We got the transalis facial arch, and we got the Cooper's ligament. Right? Cooper's ligament running out here. Now, and then of course the Henle ligament. Now among all these, these four are important. How are they important? Let's see how they are important. I'll, uh, we'll come to we'll stick to that now. I just cover this at this point of point of time. Now, when we understood the Hasselbeck triangle, we understood the intrapigastric vessel going like this, and we had basically the lateral part, uh, the the uh, lateral margin of the excess abdominis, and we had the guanal ligament. So far, so good. But the problem with this is only one geometrical problem. 
and the geometrical problem is that in geometry a triangle is a bilaminar structure it's a it's not a, a, a structure which has got a bi a biplanar not a triplanar structure it's got one single plane or rather uniplanar it's a uniplanar structure that means you have to have one plane that means all the structures lying in one single plane now here what do you find the inferior epic acid is lying where for, for the sake of discussion for a hasselbalch triangle the inferior epic acid is lying where preperitoneum left side abdominis superficial most layer in guanine ligament more superficial so we are trying to describe a triangle with structures which are lying in three different layers of the abdominal wall does it make sense geometrically it does it does but suppose if we took up structures lying in transalis fascia and with this we try to define the redefine the hasselbalch triangle can we do it let's see same layer arch same layer sling same layer alveolar tract why not do that why not do that easily done so a modified definite hasselbalch triangle is basically that the modified hasselbalch triangle is the aponeurotic arch the alveolar tract and the facial sling okay so that that is one of the the advantages or rather i would say one of the uses of uh, the analogs of the uh, Uh, of the other uh, patient now there is we'll talk about when we talk about this uh, one of the features right so look about the inguinal hernia just a few words on inguinal hernia almost you knowing about it but just a few uh, uh, figures that you should need to know that 75 to 80% of all abnormal hernias are inguinal hernias see this figure 80% a very high percentage that means it leaves only 20% of the rest of the hernia including the hernia right lifetime risk of 27% in men and 3% in women Single hernia, life hernia, so contractile hernia is studied. Then we have a hernia on the right side. Your incidence of left side having it is the left side hernia. Male, female, we all know very common in males. Indirect more common than the direct. Bilateral right more common than the left. Right? Bilateral twelve to fifteen percent cases. Right almost sixty-five. And we know why that is. We just not talk about the physical side because the late descendancy uh, of the or the late closure of the posterior area. Now the triangles we are talking about. Let's start triangle. Basically, was the Hessel triangle, the supra-inguinal triangle. That means above the inguinal ligament. Here we look at the 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 uh, alveolar tract. So above this is basically the Hessel triangle. Okay. So it is basically the conjoint tendon, the rectus abdominis, inguinal ligament, the corpus ligament. Or more appropriately, we want to properly redefine it. Let's define the Hessel triangle. Arch, alveolar ligament, alveolar tract. Okay, so that is basically the Hessel triangle. Look, look at this Hessel back triangle. See, 1840 when it was described, this was describing a triangle both consisting supra-inguinal and inferior-inguinal. That was Hessel back triangle 1814. Now today, what do we define Hessel back triangle? We just not told you. It's the epic acid, rectus, and inguinal ligament. That is the definition today. 1840, this was this was different. Now probably later on they may adhere to this new definition that we are trying to propagate. That that would be again a third definition of a triangle. We don't know. Uh, a lot of people don't follow that triangle, uh, this new definition. But nevertheless, that is one of the the definition which can be adhered to if you want to explain the geometrical definition of the Hasselbalch triangle. We all know about this tube, this this uh, hollow tube. That uh, not a hollow tube. It's a tubular structure on two ends. You got the BI and the SIR. The canal 3.5 boundary superior anterior posterior anterior contents. Now, I won't waste time on this. we all know that right now the floor and the arch i i think i just need to tell you the arching parietal oblique transverse floor and guanine ligament and the rolled up portion external oblique upper neurosis thickened medially by the lacrimal ligament that means the region of pubic tubercle this part is thickened to form the lacrimal ligament right the anterior wall the upper neurosis external oblique reinforced by the lateral oblique laterally similarly posterior wall transverse fascia Reinforced medially by the conjoint area. See this term, conjoint area, not just the conjoint tendon. The term now being propagated is conjoint area. Why conjoint area? Because ninety-five percent of these patients they don't have a tendon in the structure where we were describing a conjoint tendon earlier. There is no tendon out there. Look at this figure. Look at this figure. Transverse fascia. Now what do you find out here? Transverse abdominis muscle, internal oblique, right? The antepartal internal oblique. You see this part. Now these two basically are forming the posterior wall. Now there is no tendon out here, no tendon. Remember that figure I showed you where the muscles were extending right up to the lacrimal area and the the part where it was extending uh, uh, in between, uh, stopping short of that. I showed you that figure. 
I'll just show that one minute to make you understand that much better. Yeah, see this figure. See this figure? Posterior wall, anterior wall, right? The lower part, that is the rolled up edge of the inguinal ligament. This is basically an area where you have the fusion. This is a conjoint tendon. Here, do you have any fusion? No, this is a conjoint area. So this is not a conjoint area, this is a conjoint tendon. Unfortunately, 5%. 95%. So here you can see the, the the lower, the anterior, and the posterior. All the all the the uh, boundaries of the inguinal ligament. Oh, oh, sorry, of the inguinal canal, right? Okay. Now, new insight in the deep inguinal ring. See what I've written? Is this a typing error? A typo error? No, it's not. It's not. It's not a typo error. It is deep inguinal ring. This is the new understanding now that there are two deep inguinal rings, not one. And what are these two deep inguinal rings all about? Because now we know that there are two layers of transalus fascia and these structures have to exist through both of them. So they have to have two rings to it. So we have got two deep inguinal rings. Number one ring which is there in transalus fascia number one and fascia number two. So far so good. So you'd say, what is the fun in describing two layers? Let there be two layers. Let there be two deep inguinal rings. Is there any clinical importance to it? Let's see what the clinical importance is all about. Of course, if you want to define some kind of new anatomical structure, there has to be some kind of a clinical importance in Ashford. Right? Now, the second layer of transalus fascia has been rechristened as membranous layer of transalus fascia. So you have layer number one, and then into the inguinal wall, then you go to the membranous layer, that is layer number two, and then you've got the the third layer or the prepared rotation. Okay. Now, this layer number two is dividing the prepared rotation into two parts, parietal and visceral plane. Okay. Now, the the problem between these two or, or the thing important was that I just now told you that the parietal plane is what I told you. The vessels lying into layer one and layer two. Accept it. Agreed. We don't dissect from that particular area and the visceral plane, you know that. But what is the important is you treat the small rings. Now, those who have done surgery, or being surgery being done, when you're trying to mobilize the sac in the region of the deep inguinal ring, when you try to cut the transalis fascia, you cut one layer and you find that there is another layer underneath it. Now, if you don't cut that layer, what's going to happen? That would be an incomplete dissection of the neck of the sac and they would have to be written. So, when are you sure that you've cut the secondary DIR? Only when you find extra pedal fat spouting out from that particular layer. So next time you go and do a hernia operation, be sure that when you're dissecting the sac, when you cut the first layer and you still find that the fat is not coming out, you have not cut the second layer. So that second layer cutting has to be important, right? So if you look at this figure, here you have to cut both the layers. Both the layers have been cut out here. The two layers out here, layer one and layer two. See these two layers? So you have to cut the two layers out here. So you have to cut both the layers if you want to dissect the complete neck of the sac. Similarly, no type of error out here. There's not a typewriter error. Not an error. It is rings again. That means now we have got four rings instead of the two that we understood initially. One SIR, one DIR. Now we know two SIRs and two DIRs. Right? Now, SIR, basically, uh, what we knew was the external oblique aplerosis. Very good. We knew that. What was the secondary SIR? The second SIR is, if you remember, the layer which is lying in front of the external oblique is what? The fascia and in front of the skin. Now, the fascia, if you remember, is the wall has got two layers to it. One, the fatty, the campus fascia, and then you've got the membranous, which is the scarpal fascia. Agree? Now, the scarpal fascia has to allow the cord to exit from the external uh, SIR into this corner. Unless this fascia is also perforated, these uh, cord structures cannot enter into the scrotum. That means there has to be an opening in this scarpa fascia, which is known as the glottis fascia in this particular area, for the parallel of the cord. It has to enter into the scrotum, so this fascia has to be an opening and funnel along with it. That means it has to form a layer along with the, uh, the cord structure and enter into the scrotum. That's what has to be uh, done. So this was important. They can say, yes, we all knew that. Was the important of the secondary SIR? The importance of this is very much. Number one, see if there's any kind of pathology in this secondary SIR, that means the fascia 
the blood is pressure in particular area if there are adhesions in particular area or it's undetermined or if there is access what could happen in this scenario this is the reason why you have bad sort of test which variety the deviated variety the deviated variety we all know the types of maldecent the arrested the retractile and the deviated deviated basically means the test is already come to the sir and from there it deviates from its normal path of descent it will come to a normal path that is instead of going to the scrotum i can go to the most common deviated variety which is the superficial involved pouch you all know that what is the superficial involved pouch superficial the pouch is nothing but the test is lying it been above the external oblique of a rotor and we need the blood pressure that means there is a beyond that ir it has not been able to perforate the the blood pressure instead it has migrated in between the gorget and the external oblique so that is the reason that is for a superficial valve uh, the the secondary sir right so mild descent of test is testicular ectopy and limit the descent of hernia sac into the scrotum until very late that means also prevent a uh, gobular seal from becoming a funicular and a funicular it was scrotal at a very late stage so now you know the importance of dir uh, the secondary dir and the secondary sir right so remember that so this is basically what it looks like now two dir and two sir as i had secondary external valve ring the primary or what we knew and this is again the dir and the secondary dir okay so that is important and if at all you want to say this exam let me let me be very frank about this this part that at me which uh, with, uh, which not many are familiar with i think very uh, small uh, group of persons are familiar with it you can always give us that not are you are you we have not are you tumhare can you please the close the mic yeah. you can always quote yeah, attend your knowledge with respect khali nahi kiya karna the person the webinar aate honge na the maximum uh-huh. work on surgical anatomy so you can always quote sandel acker for the one who who has given the maximum amount of surgical work in surgical anatomy anyway so just remember that these are there if somebody asks you say that this is basically from that particular uh, source okay now this is basically we already talked about that how it works now the cord contains the three vessels and the three nerves now what exactly is wrong with this is that the ileo hypogastric is not exactly inside the cord it is running on the uh, along the superficial surface of the body so you may or may not like to combine with the cord content so the cord content is yes, the genital branch and the ileo branch nerve is attached itself to this particular area right now the vessels are there the intraspermatic also the testicular artery the external spermatic or the trabecular artery and the artery the vas deferens both of these are basically from the ileo vesicle which remember that we we said that this is basically the remnant of the umbilical artery right and of course the lymph vessel the vascular nerve and the vascular is part of the content and look at the content again the covering of the cord slight discrepancy out here the view of perspective and that is the inner covering is from the somatic fascia that is the transparent fascia that is the internal somatic fascia is the transparent fascia Not from the transverse uh, abdominal aponeurosis, not from there. So the aponeurosis, transverse abdominal aponeurosis, does not give any covering to the uh, cord structure. What gives the covering is the transverse fascia, right? And this is basically the layer of transverse fascia, especially layer number two and layer number three, which are coming along with it, right? The middle layer is. The- <laughs> Uh, the congenital hernia form. So we basically, if 
Advisors are administered for the biological development rather than the body. All the general hardia, all the general hardia are administered through the biological development. This is what happens. This is related to the change of bone mass. It comes down to the change of the changes of bone mass of that matter, which is related to the development of the general hardia. Now we all know seven months at the end. Eight months is higher than the canal. Six months at SIR. We all know that. First, it goes right. The policy is by what the number one, the first generalist and the governor. Right? We all know that. Basically, what happens after that? What happens after that is that the first generalist usually closes. Right? Closes throughout, except the part is formed with the second generalist, which is formed with the third generalist. We all know that. Now. Our vulnerable population closes to the first generalist. Forty percent initially close during the first month of life, and twenty percent initially close by two years of age. Now you know the reason why we advise patients who come with us with a bad hernia that wait one and a half to two years. Why do we advise that in the opinion? Because we know that by two years, a further twenty percent are going to obliterate. And how are they going to obliterate? By conversion to fibrous structure. We just go on that and have the okay. But 20% of boys still have patent processes at two years. There it is. And these are the patients who probably would be having a development of congenital hernia. You have a lack of congenital hernia. The incidence of contralateral patency versus analysis would be almost 12%. Remember these figures. So that means what? Not all patent processes are proceed uh, are going to proceed to the hernia. Now we know the patient has got a process of analysis. We just saw that we are doing a unilateral congenital hernia laparoscopically, and what do you find? You find contral atlas. He has got a patent process of analysis. Now the immediate response is that we operate on this also. But remember one thing. Remember that across ten years follow up, only twelve percent of these patents would develop into hernia. Which means what? That means all patent process of analysis, which analysis do not develop into hernia. They don't. And at the same time, if you're doing a surgery for hernia, 10 to 12 percent risk of developing chronic pain. Now these two factors are important, which are very important to say that you should not do a prophylactic contralateral repair of the implant. If you know why it should be done, two reasons. Number one, that every contralateral process is not going to develop into a we are talking about the hernia. Develop into hernia. And number two. 12% stand the risk of having pain after surgery, right? So these are the two reasons. Now look at the causes of bilateral hernia. We all know that the anatomical causes. I just run through them: the number triangle, the posterior canal, the structure, the structure traversing boundary, the diaphragmatic boundary, and the pelvic diaphragm. Esophageal hiatus, push out orifice, femoral area, operative foramen, gluteal, uh, the gluteal greater and lesser foramen, and the DIR and things like that. Muscular defect, diaphragmatic defect. Wide and short pelvis again, uh, anatomical pre-regulation, uh, pre-regulation for a uh, hernia formation. Congenital, non-obliterated process of analysis, just not found that. Genetic, collagen disorders, all kinds of collagen disorders, especially those involving the alteration ratio one, uh, collagen one to three ratio, and collagen four, Marfan's early cell loss type four, or just imperfect, uh, imperfect uh, that is the heart disease, hurting and so on and so forth. Now, calcitonin D-related peptide, hepatocyte growth factor, they also influence the closure of the I'll just show you how it does that. And then any kind of trauma, it's a surgical trauma, I think. These trauma would always be giving rise to uh, increased prediction for hernia formation. What about the collagen disorders? Hereditary bias? Yes. We now know that a hernia, a bad hernia could be hereditary. That means it tends to run in family, right? Where sisters are affected girls. So, mothers, daughters are at increased liability to hernia formation. And we have identified four inguinal hernia susceptible loci on the gene. Sisters affected girls, increase risk. Sister affected brothers, increase risk. Other sibling affected child, increase risk. So remember, sibling increase and from mother to uh, down to a father, down to the offspring. So in both the conditions, we have a hereditary bias. So it could be a hereditary disease. Then of course some aggravating factors, the lifestyle that you find. Two things need to be stressed. Number one, professional weightlifters are not easily susceptible. Remember that this will seem to be illogical to you, but it is proved by evidence that basically professional weightlifters are not susceptible. Similarly, 
in viral hernia is less common in obesity. So obesity is not a factor propagating viral hernia. Pregnancy, it does, but it's not due to laxity. That's why you find increased results of the hernia in these patients of black hernia and in the uh, postpartum time. That's the reason why it happens. The black hernia and the internal hernia that we have. The elderly, age-related collagen degeneration and smokers increase the risk. Coming to the most important thing, that is, what is the congenital cause? What, why does the processes close in some? It doesn't close in others. If you look at the normal phenomenon occurring, is that there are myopicial cells present in the process. Myopicial cells basically helping in what? These who are helping in the descent of the testes. By what? By propelling the testes in the scrotum. This was a normal function. Once it occurred, the testes went to the scrotum. The processes would be obliterating by what? By apoptosis, these myopathial cells would be disappearing and they would be replaced by fibrous tissue facilitating process analysis. Very simple process. Very simple procedure. Myopathial cells, the processes, these process analysis cells were propelling the testes into the scrotum. Later on, apoptosis of these cells and replacement by cells. Clear. But what is happening in abnormal patients? What they demonstrated is that in these remnant processes, which were not closing down with the hernia, they found remnants of the smooth muscle cells. They were still existing in the, in the walls of the process. They identified them. And how they identified them? They still found the nuclei there. That means there was insufficient apoptosis of these cells. Now, why is it occurring? Why did the cells disappear? Obviously, there has to be something wrong with them. Could it be something with a sympathetic nervous system abnormality? And how do they do that? Androgens are known to release calcitonin gene-related peptides. So the calcitonin gene-related peptide, the CGRP, is basically regulated by the androgens. And why? Because they help in the descent of the testes. Remember. Okay? But there is something wrong out here. And here is that there may be a deficiency of CGRP. Right? Now, what does CGRP do? Normally transform these epithelial cells into missing number fibroblasts. That's what we wanted. We wanted a fibroblast conversion. Agreed. What else? Now, those which underwent fibroblastic transformation, they in turn secreted some other factor, the hepatocyte uh, growth factor, and they again led to more epithelial cells undergoing apoptosis and fibroblast. Right? So, CGRP and HGF are both propagating mesalchymal fibroblast generation in the process. Okay? Now, obliteration of the process of analysis may be regulated by other mechanisms, like for example, the transforming growth factor B1. So, the myobithelial cells would not be going into mesenchymal fibroblast if there is a dearth or a decrease in the free cytokine. And that is what is exactly happening in this patient, who has a persistence of process analysis. And where is the maximum concentration uh, of the, of the uh, remnant cells? You find them usually in the region where there's a local signaling around the internal ring. In the region of the DIR, you find the maximum concentration of myopathy, right? And there, the maximum uh, conversion to fibula. That's uh, it uh, stands to reason. We are closing down the opening. With closing of the opening, the whole processes undergoes fibula, right? So the, the remnant of these smooth muscle cells are found in these particular areas, uh, the, the, along the ring of the, the, the neck of the process analysis, and along with that, there has been documented shortage or decrease in the secretion of the cytokinal element, which has led to a decreased amount of mesenchymal fibroblastic activity. Do you agree with the statement? All environmental hernias, both direct and direct, are congenital origin. You may or may not, but we can put forward uh, points in favor of this. Indirect, easy to understand that. There was a remnant processor which was there and at later point of time because of some reason of increased IAP, it opened up, right? It had not undergone full fibroblastic conversion into obliteration. Easy. What about direct? How can you explain a direct uh, congenital theory for the direct hernia or the medial hernia as we now know it? Congenitally weak posterior wall and high arch fibers of transverse fusion or arch. Easy to explain. If the transverse facial arch is highly arched, these fibers never approximate with those of IPT, thus leave a gap even during maximum increase in IAP. What do I mean by that? Remember I told you the shuttering mechanism. This is a diagrammatic view I tried to draw for you. Now, look at this. This is basically the arching fibers. This is the IAP tract, the transverse facial arch, the rectus. Now, under normal circumstances, a contraction of these muscles would straighten these fibers out 
and closes. Close down. Along with the anterior muscles, which means the arching part of the external oblique, uh, of the trans, uh, trans abdominal and the external oblique. Agreed. But in a scenario, oh, fibers are very high arching. The high arching fibers, along with a defect in this particular area, would lead to two things. Defect already exists, and because, and at the same time, when they had to close this gap, they're not closing the gap. Why? Because maximum straightening still leaves the gap out here. So, high arching fibers, and number two, a weakening, a inherent genetic weakening in the posterior wall are two reasons by which we can say that even the medial hernias could be having a congenital origin. Right? Now, some special terminologies, I think you all know about this, just so that you, uh, just a repetition. A man is in same appendix. We all know interstitial omentosis. I don't think we need to details of that. The intestine and the the omentum. Litter's hernia. The meckles lying inside the sac. Rictus, your part of the intestinal wall, so partial uh, luminal narrowing. And then you have the medial hernia, two separate loops, and the Y-shaped hernia. I have to remember. So these names. I think there are about 20, 25 names for these hernias. Forget those. Just remember these important names. And you got the these uh, medial basically. There are two loops, two separate loops inside. And the problem with this, the applied importance is that you have to bring out the loops such that you have only one afferent entering and one efferent coming out from the. Until you've done that, until you've done that, be sure that there could be a loop lying inside. Pantaloon hernia, you've got both a direct and indirect, which is straddling the intrapic acid vesicle. And sliding basically, one wall is formed by an organ along with its visceral peritoneum. And the most common on the right side is the cecum, on the left side is sigma. That means in this case, in a sliding hernia, the whole of the sac is not parietal peritoneum. One part is parietal peritoneum, the other is an organ with it, with it, with the peritoneum. Okay? So that is what is uh, uh, making the, uh, the sac. Some clinical definitions, we have talked about this. Bobinocele, we all know, in the uh, canal, funicular, up to the uh, neck of the scrotum, complete or scrotal. Clinical presentation, reducible, irreducible, also known as incarcerated. These two terms are almost synonymous. Obstructed, where there's a luminal compromise. Strangulated, vascular compromise. Infarcted, where there's a complete vascular compromise, resulting in gangrene of the, of the surface. Now, the, uh, the examination, nothing to tell you about the DIR occlusion. We all know that. The uh, social inguinal uh, ring, the imagination test, a big no should not be done and should not be said so. Why? Because it's a very, very painful and does not add to any kind of diagnosis for you. So SIR is an investigation mentioned, or examination mentioned to be deferred. It should not be done. A three fingers immense test and look for a shear malganese bulge. The last thing is very, very important. If you are doing a hernia repair and a patient's got a lot of malganese bulges, what are malganese bulges? is basically an inherent widespread weakening of the whole of the inguinal region. It's not only that particular area, the rest of the inguinal, the, the lower abdominal wall in the inguinal region is weak because of collagen or whatever reason uh, could be ascribed to it. But if the whole thing is weak, your hernia is bound to fail. So if the patient has got malganese bulge, don't do a hernia repair. Don't do a hernia repair. If at all you want to do a hernia repair, it has to be a very widespread mesh repair in these cases. So don't go in for a simple hernia wrap in a patient with malganese bulge. So this has to be looked for. So in, in those patients where you are examining a hernia, apart from the fact that you confirm it's a hernia by being inguinal scrotal and cuff impulse and irreducibility, then for differentiating between the two, uh, or rather three, the three fingers MS and DIR occlusion test, these are important. Now, in addition, always examine both the testes and contralateral side. Don't forget it. 10 to 12 percent is bilateral. In a diagonal hernia, just remember it's rare in females, wide neck, so rare obstruction, and usually limited up to the neck of the scrotum. Now, this is one the said. This is basically cut. Why I'm going to cut? Because this should not be done. Don't do it. Now, see here. The index finger, the middle finger, and the, the ring finger. Agree. DIR, SIR, and where is this? This was the femoral canal. Now, suppose on cuff impulse, you, what do you do? You reduce and then you put your fingers out here and ask the patient to cuff. Agreed. You find that there's no cuff impulse right now. You remove this, find a cuff impulse or exiting of, a, of a, um, uh, swelling. You say it is a indirect or a lateral hernia. You put it there. Here appears after removal of the finger, a direct or a medial hernia. Here, femoral. Not very easily discernible because femoral hernia is not easily discernible clinically. But suppose if on cuffing with all the three fingers in place, you still find a cuff impulse out here. 
that is basically a supra cycle remember that so that is the zeeman's technique modified zeeman's technique that with all the triggering that is played you still find a calf impulse that is a supra cycle external supra cycle is that clear so a zeeman's technique with all fingers in place three fingers in place calf impulse positive medially it is a external supra cycle and then of course the three fingers we all know what these three fingers stand for differential diagnosis i'm not going to uh, waste time on this you all know that the vaginal hydrocele the intestinal varus cortical and the viral hydrocele spermato varico nephangeal they got a few more hernia and you mild test test with a viral test i told you visual canal pouch that is one of the most important or lying inside the lying inside the viral canal and then of course the lipoma of the cord right now investigations are not usually indicated but only in doubtful diagnosis as with a very small bubonal seal or just a increase in the pressure at the dir not even a bubonal seal just a increase in the pressure but one thing you have to remember is that the peritoneum could be protruding through the dir into the anal canal normally 1 cm remember that if you have a protrusion of 1 cm don't call it a hernia don't call it a hernia which we are want to do when you open a patient with a hernia which we thought was a hernia and then we found there no hernia and then we pick up that particular piece of peritoneum and say look this is the hernia this is the hernia that's not a hernia that's not a hernia so don't try to mask your incompetency in diagnosing a hernia by picking on a fold of peritoneum inside the dir near the dir and say that this is a hernia because 1 cm of the perit parietal peritoneum in under normal circumstances would be entering just beyond the dir and is not called as hernia is that clear now what else do you require apart from a clinical examination which suffices for more than 90 95% of patients you may need a contrast peritoneography or herniography with wall salva now you just inject a, a, a radio contrast dye into the peritoneal cavity and it spreads through the peritoneal cavity you ask the patient to do a wall salva maneuver and then you do a x ray as simple as that right in a, in a lateral view and you find that there is a pouching of the dye into the valve canal CT scan and MRI are required for one important reason, and that is ruling out other causes of inguinal pelvic girdle pain. Why? Because this is one of the most common erroneous reason for erroneous diagnosis. The patient comes to you and say, "Look, I've got pain in this region. I've got a bulge. Okay, agree. Very happy. You make a diagnosis immediately. Hernia. Keep him for the next OT. Very happy. I will get to get to do a hernia. Everybody is happy." But the problem comes when the patient keeps coming back to you. The second opening, the third post-operative, the fourth post-operative, they say, "Look, my pain is still there." Now you start trying to understand. They will try to follow up the patient by saying there could be other reason. But my dear sir, this reason is always there even in the initial phases. You forgot to examine this patient. So remember one thing: that if you have a pain in the pelvic girdle or the guanal region along with the swelling. don't take it for granted that this pain is because of that bulge remember that do not if the pain is there and you cannot explain the pain with that swelling you have the slightest doubt go ahead and do a ct scan and mri especially for the cause of pain in the pelvic girdle namely the ligamentous structures and the muscle structures and the bony structures anything could be causing pain in that particular area so rule them out before going ahead and saying that this hernia is responsible for your pain so pain in out of tune With the amount of swelling, should always be investigated. Similarly, if we do HRS with a wall salva, can again diagnose a early bubonal seal for you. So either do a contrast peritoneography or do an HRS with wall salva. Laparoscopy remains one of the methods which would be there in a doubtful hernia, and it demonstrates two things to you. Number one, it contains you both the the hernia on the same side. It can also diagnose the occult hernia for you, contralateral hernia for you, right? So this could be one of the investigations you can look for. classification is important why because it helps in planning the treatment it helps in planning the treatment and the earliest classification there were i think about 10 or 12 classification or even more probably uh, for inguinal hernia but the one which was usually adhered to was the nearest classification why very for very easy type 1 type 2 had to do with a indirect hernia very simple one two indirect one with a normal dir then in dir very easy to remember type 1 Indirect normal DIR, type two indirect normal DIR, both you will know. When you come to three, you can go from medial to lateral. So medial triangle direct valve hernia, lateral indirect, along with what? A posterior defect. That means the dilatation DIR is such that it enlarges the whole posterior. 
and 3C, we've all heard it. So 3A, 3B, and 3C. Simple. Medial, lateral, and below. It's here. Type 4 is basically a recurrent hernia. I'll not go to the Gilbert's classification, but I'll talk about a classification which is now being adhered to why it's more pragmatic, very easy to remember. And then the European Hernia Society classification 2007. Right? Look, this, this is how it classifies. They make a chart like this. The P and R basically stand for primary and recurrent. The lateral hernia, the medial hernia, and femoral. The lateral stands for what? Indirect. Medial stands for what? Direct. And femoral, we all know femoral. Now, what do these two stand for? One, two, three. What is one, two, and three? One, two, three is basically one finger, two finger, and three finger. What finger? The tip of the finger. Now, what about the tip of the finger? The usual size tip of the index finger is around 1.5 to 2 cm. That's what they have taken into account. Right? So, are they putting one finger, two fingers, three fingers? And at that time, when you decide that what repair I'm going to do. Introducing one finger, I'll do this repair. It does not introduce any finger, I'll do this repair. That because I'm a candidate hernia. You do any kind of repair, you don't do any repair except for herniotomy. Herniotomy should be known as. Right? So, basically, if you classify or you uh, basically look at the hernia this, uh, by this method, you could be classifying a right side right hernia as a primary. Number two, lateral and two. That means two fingers. So, right-sided PL2 would mean a right-sided indirect hernia, which is basically a indirect hernia, which is primary, and it, the DIR is dilated to two fingers. That's how we look at it, right? So, it's more pragmatic, and that is why it is now more commonly followed, right? Now, the treatment principles, just do the treatment principles, and I think we'll talk about that later. The treatment principles are simple. Number one, every hernia should not be operated. The new dictum is to not operate on it every hernia. The, the tendency in the surgery, OPDs is, the moment you get a hernia, you don't need to ask anything to the patient. They don't bother to ask anything. Patient of hernia, we are admitting. Sir, can we address this patient? Hernia. Shouldn't be done. Shouldn't be done. Wait and watch. When? Early pubertal seal. Why do you want to operate in this patient? A asymptomatic patient. He's not bothered about it. He just came to you, look, this is like something. Uh, Coming out of the abdominal lower part. Do you have any problem with it? No, I don't have any problem. Why do you want to operate this patient? A direct viral hernia has got a very large neck, a very wide neck. Don't operate this patient early. Elderly patient, 80 plus, don't open such patient. Estrogen reluctant patient, not you advise him everything. You, you explain everything to him very, very comfortably, make him sit comfortably, and you advise that he should look, he, look, he should get an operation done. He says, No, I don't want to get that. So don't force him to get an operation. If you want to or you decide a surgical operation, then you have two options for you. Number one, an open or endoscopic operation. About 15 years back, I think, no, this was 2015 figures, that only 20, 30%, 20% uh, of all surgeons were attempting laparoscopic of hernia. Now, about 2020, it has now become 30%, but what is good is that the numbers are increasing. They are now increasing. That means more and more uh, surgeons are now, laparoscopic surgeons are jumping onto the bandwagon of laparoscopic hernia. So, we are getting more and more patients, uh, sorry, we are getting more and more surgeons who want to do a laparoscopic hernia, who are doing laparoscopic hernia surgery, right? So, the options are there, the op open and the endoscopic, and when you're doing open and endoscopic, the things are very clear. Number one, you have to manage the stack. Number two, you have to manage the DIR. And number three, you have to repair the posterior wall. As simple as that. Just three simple principles. Manage the stack, narrow the DIR, and repair the posterior wall. So far, so good. Now, there's some terminology of surgical management. Herniotomy, herniectomy, herniotomy, herniotomy. Herniectomy may seem to be a new term to you. But looking at the correct terminology, when you say ectomy, it means removal. And if you're removing the hernial sac, cutting and removing it, it should be herniectomy, not herniotomy. Herniotomy should be what? Open the sac, close it, and deposit it back. That's herniotomy. So that is basically dissection of the sac, open to visualize the contents, close and deposit the band in the pubertal space. Then you like to call it a herniotomy. But if you're ligating the sac and removing it, why call it herniotomy? It should be herniotomy. Anyway, people don't follow this term. Everything up to that end is known as herniotomy. Then the two more terms, herniotomy and herniotomy. Remember, the definition of herniotomy is approximation of edges. And that also tensionless approximation. The word approximation is very important. Herniotomy, the term bridging is very important. The term bridging, that means the two ends of the defect, in one, you are bringing them close together, that is approximation. In the other, you are leaving them at their places, 
but you're inserting something in between. You're bridging. And it's natural tissue, it's biological tissue is in there, whatever. That would be herniaplasty. Right? Now, both herniaplasty and herniaplasty can be done for an inguinal hernia. It could be done as an anterior repair or a posterior repair. Now, look, this is another terminology which is new, which will be new to you. What does the anterior repair and what does the posterior repair mean? An anterior repair basically means they're utilizing structures for repair which is lying anterior to the cord at any part of the inguinal canal. Like for example, what do you want a best knee repair? You are stitching what? You are stitching the conjoined area to the inguinal ligament. The conjoined area is made up of what? Transfer abdominis and the internal oblique. Is transfer abdominis and internal oblique lying posteriorly throughout the length of the cord? No. The L part of the cord is, is forming what? The anterior boundary of the inguinal canal. Then it is coming arching and then coming posterior to the part. That means this structure laterally was like anterior, now it's like posterior. So if you try this structure, we anterior repair. But let's talk about the transalis fascia. Is it lying anterior to the part at any point? No. It's lying posterior to the inguinal canal at one, at all points. So if you utilize the transalis fascia, it will be a true posterior repair. So basically anterior repair are those which are utilizing structures which at some part is lying anterior to the inguinal canal. And posterior repairs are those which are lying totally posterior at all parts of the inguinal canal, right? Anterior posterior. Now, we said sac management is the first thing. So, the section of sac should be up to the neck, and I just now told you the transalis fascia and the two DIRs, and once the second layer of fascia has been incised, then you find the pouting of the fat. Then you're sure that now you've gone up to the neck of the sac. Now, once you deceive the sac totally, what do you want to do with it? One, you can deposit it back into the prepetal space without ligation. That reduces the post-operative pain. Remember, ligating a sac is very, very painful post-operative. Why? Because parietal peritoneum has got sensory supply, and the more you ligate the parietal peritoneum, is going to compress the nerves, so be painful post-operative. So, if at all you want to push it back, do it without ligation. Right? And when would you attempt this? When you have got a small sac, which is easily mobilizable and completely disabled. Now, those sacs which are mobilized with difficulty should not be done so. Why? The more the difficult operation, uh, more the difficult mobilization, the more the chances of bleed. So, post-operative hematoma formation, the most, more messy the operation, the more chance of post-operative bleed and hematoma formation. So, in those patients where the sac is not completely detectable, very difficult, in those what you do, dissect the neck, transject it, and leave the distal part in situ. Leave it there. Leave it there. And now, this is sad. No problem. The very large total sack, you can easily do that. Or the third option could be ligation of the sack, external sack, and open congenital herniotomy. Like an open congenital herniotomy. That means you ligate and excise. Here, you don't ligate, you push it back. So, detect, push it back, ligate, excise, ligate, and excise only the distal part. Okay? So, this is basically the three things you can do with the sac. The tension free repair of the posterior wall. You're doing that, basically you can do a little repair. That is what? Little repair is repair of the DIR. That means you want to repair the deep inguinal vein. I told you the second thing need to be done. Number one, the sac. Number two, DIR. And number three was the posterior wall. So, in repair of the DIR, it's a little repair. What do you do? You narrow the deep inguinal vein. And how do you narrow it? You narrow it from medial to lateral. So, if this is a medial part and the ring is out here, coming out here, and the cord is coming out here. So, you start applying sutures from here and go here. Now, when you're doing this, the cord is going to be pushed more and more laterally. That's what you want. Because you want to maintain the obliquity of the inguinal canal. At the same time, you also want to narrow the DIR. So, narrowing by medially applied sutures, pushing the cord laterally. And it's an important essential component of all lateral inguinal hernia. Why? Because they all exist from dilated DIA. So, this is very important. Subsequent to that, then you want to repair the posterior wall. And how do you want to repair the posterior wall? By anterior or posterior repair. Now, both anterior and posterior could be herniography and herniopathy. Anterior herniography, I told you best thing. The oldest, time tested, and still done by almost 50 60 percent of the Second is shoulder. Then I specialize institutions and other shoulder splint. That is still what it is. But the gold standard still remains the anti-herniopathy, and that is a lichen scene. 
This is basically a hardy center in North America, shoulders to the lap, and they give very good results. But there's a big but to it. These results were never reproducible outside their center. That means anybody doing a shoulders repair outside a shoulders uh, uh, hernia center would not be giving the same recurrence. And that's why, despite the fact that anatomically was considered to be uh, a good repair, it was very, very cumbersome. Why you apply four layers of anterior sutures? You give four layers, and the more the sutures, the more the damage to the layers. We all know that. The less the sutures, the more, less the damage. So basically, surgical principles don't hold true for uh, shoulder repair, and that's why it's now uh, fallen out of favor. So we does it again, right? Now we said posterior hernia, right? Back to Cooper Lego repair. See this. This is the iliopetal line. Cooper Lego, right? This is the external oblique, the guanine ligament behind, and this on the iliopetal line. Now where is the uh, suture being applied? Start at the fascia with the Cooper Lego, right? So this is basically a true. A true posterior repair. We are using what two passes are that is fashion. Now when you're trying to do this, when you're trying to do this, you want to switch out here. There's always tension over the anterior that fashion. Always tension over there, right? So what do you do? You make a long tube split over. So when you apply these sutures, it opens up. That means this split opens up into an oblong, and this becomes a weak area. Why? Because the anterior fascia is gone. Only the muscle is there. Is there a posterior fascia in this area? No posterior fascia. Below the arcuate line, no posterior fascia. That means now become weak. So what do you do here? You stretch the edges with the muscle, or you apply a mesh over here. This is known as a tether slide. What is sliding? The anterior fascia is sliding. It is sliding where towards the inferior line. That is the tether slide, right? I'll just complete this. That these are posterior plasty that we know. The, all of these basically just remember the principle is. That you want to do a posterior plasty, that means you want to go in the inferior area from behind. You have to give a decision at least three to four centimeters above the pubic bone, right? So all of them are there. So you can have a knee or something, Google, Sugari. We we have a certain plaster. There is another repair that we do. The ribs, but I just like to mention the ribs so particularly. Why? Because that is the basis of all present day laparoscopic repair. This stupa basically was a pre-peritoneal technique in the sense he gave either supramarital or anterior incision, <laughs> went into the pre-peritoneal fascia that we are talking about, layer number two, layer number three, and he threw a mesh across from one ear to the other ear, from one area here to the opposite area, right? A very very big mesh, very very cumbersome operation. It was basically an operation, a lot of bleeding in this patient. And you had to have the cord, but uh, the time was uh, quite long. Technically, very difficult to pay. But then people understood that you can play some mesh in this particular area, and that is when the TP and the TAP repair came into play. Right. So just the disadvantages of these repairs, and these repairs basically, the I told you was like in seeing, I told you was the batteries. Ah, what about the plug and plug and patch and proline and hernia mesh repair? The thing is, a Google repair. The thing is that in the body, if you try to insert something foreign, the body has to react to it. So basic principle should be what? Less of foreign material. Now the plug technique, the plug and patch technique, and protein mesh repair and tubal repair, they're using a whole lot of protein, a lot of protein. And the moment you apply a whole lot of protein, the body is going to react to it. So the very reason why they should not be done is that you should less, less, you should use less amount of artificial material, especially synthetic and protein. That's why the plug method, the plug and patch method, Tony method, they never were very, very favorable methods or picked up by uh, very, very such. They're not very commonly used, right? And then, of course, we all know that it should be tensionless, whether you're doing a battery repair or you're doing a legacy repair. Remember one thing: tensionless is very, very important. Any repair, any repair, the basic word is tensionless. There should be no tension, right? And when you're doing any kind of repair, you should aim for a recurrence rate. Of less than one percent, chronic neuralgia has to be there. This is an accepted figure of ten to twelve percent, right? Next time, I think we'll just touch more lab repairs and the new international guidelines. Can I take five more minutes of yours? I just take five more minutes. I just uh, complete the final idea. So lab repairs, the, we all know TP and TAPP. The one which is the new entrant to the family is the enhanced or extended TP repair. Now the reason why I would like to do this, more and more people are. Now, trying to propagate this method is that they say these are the advantages. 
Here, basically, you're creating opening above the umbilicus. If this umbilicus normally, in, in most of the patients, the TP repaired is a uh, intra-umbilical port. In, uh, uh, in a uh, ETP, it is a, is the umbilicus, it's about 3, 4, 5 centimeters above the umbilicus. So, you have got a whole lot of length to play about, right? So, the extrapedal space can be reached for almost anywhere in the atrium wall, and the surgical field could be enlarged. Flexible port setup, you can put up the port wherever you want. There's no fixed port position. Facilitates the section of stack and unencumbered uh, paralyzation of the cord. It was very easy. Easy to master. Even residents can learn it easy. That's what they say. I don't know how far that's true. We have not started doing this procedure. And it can expand the traditional indications. Like, for example, the ETP is now also being done for patients with hernia. Or for that matter, let's say patients patient got a very short umbilical pubic distance, a very, very small distance. You don't know where to put the port. You don't know where to put the port. So that can be used for, uh, uh, the patient can be subject to ETP in these patients, right? So previous pelvic surgery, more complex cases. So these could be the advantages where ETP can be used. So the new international guidelines, I just finished with this. The new international, we, we talked about a whole lot of procedures which can be done. So what are the new international guidelines as of 2018? And this is the hernia surge group. See, it was from all continent hernia society. All. Everybody was there. And they came up with these guidelines. Number one, there were almost 100 different techniques which were considered. And they only recommend two. Open mesh, like you see, and laparoendoscopic mesh technique, whether it's DEP or TAP. Very, very simple. They kept it very simple. They say, just do these two techniques. But they also say that. Generally accepted techniques suitable for all well hernias does not exist. It does not exist. Surgeons so should choose between their technique or they should choose between the above or others familiar to them. So that left a door open for them. That if possible, just stick to these two methods. If not, then stick to your method which you have followed. Right? TEP, TAPP is the first choice when primary unilateral well hernia and bilateral. We all know bilateral cases. But now, 2018, they have also included the primary unilateral guile hernia, which until 2018 was not an indication for uh, laparoscopic repair. It is now an indication for laparoscopic. That means either unilateral or bilateral. Indication for laparoscopic. Right? What about recurrent hernia? If it was following a previous open repair, do endoscopy. TP, TAPP. If it was following a TP, TAPP, do a Lagenstein technique. There are some people who are very good at laparoscopy. They would say that we can repeat a laparoscopic repair. But as far as the guidelines go, very simple. Open with recurrence, do laparoscopy. Laparoscopy with recurrence, do open. Very simple. Large total hernias, the stack dissection is very, very difficult. May be very difficult. Do a legacy technique or it offers some advantages. That is advantages to do a total hernia uh, with legacy. These are recommendations. I'm not going to the details of which I would like to do or would not like to do. Just a recommendation. Out of previous pelvic or lower abdominal operations, lycanstein is favored in terms of this product. Associated comorbidity, like some of the patients have got a severe cardiac problem or severe pulmonary problem. Lycanstein under, this is important, local anesthesia or real anesthesia. Right? Emergency igual hernia repair without contamination of operative field. Lycanstein or lap would depend upon the expertise of the patient, uh, of the surgeon. Emergency inguinal repair with bowel resection contamination, choice of hernia. Don't do a hernia plastic. So these are the, the recommendations, right?